Hello and welcome to another episode of This Expat Life. This Expat Life is your podcast show if you are an expat and you are looking to grow from the inside out. As always, I make space for all facets of life abroad, but always with a focus on personal development. I'm Amanda Maxime, your coach and host today. Welcome. And today I want to talk to you about becoming the CEO of your expat life. But before I start, I want to share two things with you. And the first thing is, is that I want to thank you for all the kind messages I received after my last solo podcast. In episode number 17, I share a recap of the last three years since I've been back home. And I do so pretty vulnerably, I have to say. I'm talking about all the things that happened in the past three years. And spoiler alert, they weren't very fun. And I also very openly share what it has meant for me, how those things affected me and what decisions I took. And I was just overwhelmed with the response I got to that episode. And, you know, I was at first hesitating if I should record that episode because it just felt so vulnerable. And I thought, who's going to be interested in this story? But I'm so glad that I did. Because I not only got really supportive messages that meant a lot to me personally, but I also got a lot of messages from people who said that they were going through something similar through one of the things that I've been through as well, and that they felt less alone. And actually just now, just before recording, I got a voice message from one of my former coaches who said that she was listening to the podcast uh, on one of her trips back home and that uh, her parents weren't doing very well and that she really felt great comfort in knowing that she wasn't the only one who was going through this. So that means a lot to me. Like, you know... I always say that I'm on a mission to open up space for all facets of life abroad, and I really do mean that. Often as high-achieving expats, we do not always take the space for our personal life or the things that happen outside of our career and outside of the fun, exciting things that we experience. But it's so important that we do. And I really felt with the last episode that I was creating space for some of the more negative things that happen in life. And then receiving messages of people saying that that episode was so helpful and that it made them feel less alone or feel more supported in their journey really means a lot to me because it shows to me that making space is really a good thing to do because people are benefiting from it. So thank you again for all the messages. Um, It took me a while to respond to all of them. And in fact, this episode became almost instantly the the second most popular episode. The most popular episode is still the interview with Celine Charlotte. But this one got straight to uh, number two of the most popular episode. So um, that's also a sign that opening up is really appreciated by you. So thank you again. And the second thing that I wanted to share before I really start is that my signature program, Expat Life School, is starting again in October, and I am so excited about this round. I designed Expat Life School because I know from experience as an expat, it's very easy to just respond to everything around you and to just let yourself be taken over by the flow of life abroad. But we sometimes forget that we also bring our emotional luggage, our triggers, our responses, our patterns. And I designed it because I realized that as an expat, sometimes you can take more charge of your life abroad. But you don't always need a coach. Sometimes you just need uh, to get a little nudge into the right direction, some helpful exercises, some useful information. So that's exactly what I created with this course. In seven modules, I teach you how to thrive abroad, basically. We're going to talk about mindset. If you listen to one of my previous episodes, you know how important mindset is. We're going to be talking about goal setting, but mostly goal achieving, dreaming bigger, but also the more expat topics like relationships when you live abroad, feeling at home, dealing with an uncertain future if you don't know where you're going to be, and so much more. It is a self-paced online course to which you will have access for a year, but it also comes with, I think it's the best feature, an online community period of four months. In those four months, you'll have your own tribe of like-minded expats across the globe who are all going through the same thing, who all have the same goal of creating that best expat life. And you can share with them your tips, your challenges, your struggles, your stories, And the exchange of these things is super, super valuable. But there's even more because in those four months, we will also have five group sessions together. 
I lead the group sessions and there's always a theme that we will be talking about. And it really helps us to dive a little bit deeper into some of the course topics with extra content and also extra exercises that I provide. But what I'm most excited about with this round is that there's going to be an overlap with my own move to Rio. I'm moving to Rio in January and as Expat Life School starts in mid-October and it lasts four months. The students in Expat Life School will hear all about how I prepare for my trip abroad and what I do in the first weeks, the first months when I move abroad. This is exclusive content that I will only share within Expat Life School. So if you're curious about Expat Life School, there is something that you can do right now, and that is to sign up for the standby list, as I like to call it, for Expat Life School. So we're not starting until mid-October, but I will send out an exclusive offer to those on the standby list, which will be only available to them. And this offer will have the highest discount that I will give away this round. Plus, it also comes with bonuses, if you're on time, that are worth over 500 euros. And that is not the price that you're going to pay for Expert Life School. So this is a really, really great offer. I will send out the offer to the standby list in mid-September. So if you want to get on it, just check the show notes and there's a link where you can sign up. This list is absolutely with no strings attached. You will just get a few emails from me around the offer and that's it. It's really up to you to decide if you want to take it on or not. There are zero obligations. You also won't be added to my general airmail list. So it's not like I'm going to spam you every week. It's just around this offer. So if you do not want to miss out on the highest discount and all these fantastic bonuses that I'm going to give away as well, hurry and sign up for the standby list. So back to today's topic, which is all about becoming the CEO of your expat life. And I actually came up with that phrase because I saw and also experienced myself so often that expats often react to their life abroad. Let me explain it a little bit. When you just moved abroad, there is so much coming at you at once. There is so much newness around us. You need to take care of so many things, paperwork, finding your way around town, probably a new job that you've started. There's a lot going on in your life. And with so much coming at you, you only actually have to respond to those things. In the beginning, you probably need to take a lot of decisions, um, big decisions like where am I going to live and smaller decisions like what supermarket am I going to try out today? Or am I going to say yes to that invitation from the colleague who wants to show me around town? I was actually speaking to two diplomats recently, um, not to get, like they are not together. They were both starting in new countries and they're in a phase that they've just moved. They also immediately started their jobs because there were some urgent things going on. So there was like zero time to really unpack and to get to know the city. And I also know that from my experience, actually, you get at most a couple of days, but you start your job right away when you're somewhere new. And so they are in this phase that they're just like trying to keep their head above water because from nine to five or nine to whatever, they need to give everything at work and really take in all the newness there and try to excel at something that is still so foreign to them in a way. And in their personal life, they also have to deal with everything that is coming at them. So unpacking where goes what in the house, how do we design our house here? Uh, what routines am I setting up? Oh, there's no time for a run today, but actually where should I go for a run? Because I don't know this city. Oh, and then I need to get paperwork done for my car and paperwork for this and for that. So there's so much going on in their lives that for them, it just feels like this complete overwhelm. And they only have to respond to that overwhelm. Am I going to do this? Yes or no. Am I going to do that this way? Yes or no. And sometimes it's not even a question of responding. It just happens to you because maybe you need to get some errands done and you just think, okay, that's like a walk in the park, easy. But then there's a whole thing in that country that you're in and there's a whole process that you have to go through. I'm trying to think of an example. I can't really, I'm sorry. But you know, I remember I had to do some paperwork around my car because I think I forgot to p pay a fine or something or there was something else I can't really remember. But I just had no idea what was going on, the process that I had to follow. I barely understood. I mean, I spoke Portuguese, but all these technical terms, I didn't really know what to do with them. So I just let it all come over me and hope that I wouldn't get ripped off or anything in the whole process. So 
sometimes it's not even a matter of responding. You just have to go through certain things that are really common in the host country. And also you're just really busy with setting up a routine, with setting up your life there. I remember that so clearly from my time in Brasilia when I just arrived. The first two or three days I had a very strong feeling like, oh my God, I'm totally new here. No one knows me. It's this beautiful blank canvas that I can just paint according to how I want it to set up a life the way that I always envisioned. Um, I love that period when you're just starting abroad, but it easily fades away because of all the overwhelm I was just talking about. You're trying to keep your head above the water. You're trying to set up your routine. You're trying to, yeah, to get a grip of everything that's going on around you. So I would say as an expat, especially in the beginning, you are very reactive and not so much proactive. And that's not so much a choice, like it's not like you're going to say, okay, I'm just going to be a reactive expat. Probably you don't recognize yourself in that term anyway, but it's just because there's so much going on around you externally that it almost forces you to be reactive. It can actually be quite challenging to take that proactive stance from the beginning because you really need to be grounded in yourself to not keep reacting to all those things around you, to all the overwhelm around you, to all the things that are asking your attention. I think it's almost impossible. So you get very reactive. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because expert life is really fun. You have a lot of exciting things to respond to. You're outside of your daily routine, outside of what you know. So being reactive in a new environment can actually create a really fun and exciting life. But when you only respond to outer things, you also have a risk of ending up with a life that is not 100% the life that you envisioned. So yes, you can have all those fun and exciting things, but maybe you're not really happy with your daily routine. Maybe you always wanted to take this opportunity to become that fit girl or that guy that lives in the gym. But before you know it, you have slipped back to your old patterns and you're just so busy with other things that you only hit the gym once a week. And that could be because in the beginning you said yes to so many things that got into your life and that created that whole routine. And now a few months down the line, you realize, oh, but actually I'm not so happy with that. These can be small things like going to the gym, but they can also be a little bit bigger, like your group of friends that you surround yourself with. Maybe you enjoy spending time with them, but they don't really feel like the deep connections that you crave because you just responded to their invitations in the beginning and that's who you ended up with. It sounds a little bit horrible when I say it that way. It's not how I mean it, but you know, often it's easier to respond to the things that come our way, especially when it comes to social things and to really find the connections that you want to have in your life takes a lot more effort and energy to put yourself out there and to find these people. And then those things can actually be a lot deeper and more personal. I remember when I was living in London, I had a really fun job at first, which wasn't super challenging, but I had really fun colleagues. We always hung out together, went for drinks. We traveled the world. It was really a lot of fun. And then I moved on to another role, which was definitely more interesting. It was a political and risk analyst role, uh, which perfectly matched with my master's degree that I had just finished there in Latin American politics. So I was really excited about it. But when I started working there, it's after a few weeks already, or maybe the first few days, I realized this company culture is horrible. I think about six months later, I found myself being so tired all the time with the Sunday scaries. I didn't want to go to work. I felt so bad Monday to Friday. I always needed every Friday evening to recover from that work week. Actually, I needed the whole weekend. I said no and no to more people because I just didn't have the energy for it. I actually often went to bed at 8 p.m. already because I was so tired. But I was also still seeing some of my friends, my colleagues from before, with whom I always had a great time. But what I didn't see back then is that this whole routine that I created of working so hard, of trying to get my energy back by sleeping, and then also by hanging out with some of my good friends, but mostly in pubs and everything, I actually didn't fill my energy tank. 
And I was just depleting myself more and more. And now I see it very clearly, but this was a result of a whole buildup of saying yes to things that came my way instead of really thinking, okay, who am I? What do I need? And what do I want? And how can I create a life around those pillars? And actually that horrible time in London, I was really nearing a burnout, was the start of my personal development journey. So looking back, I'm really grateful for that period as well. But at the time, it really didn't feel that way. So long story short, what I suggest is not being reactive to life abroad and to the overwhelm and all the fun, exciting things coming your way, but to take a CEO approach. How I see it is that CEOs are proactive. They have a long-term vision. They have their eyes on the ball. They really know where they're going. They are strategic. They don't shy away from difficult choices. And they also really train their mind to take out all the noise and the clutter and to not get triggered by all the small things, but to really have that long-term approach, knowing where they're going and how to get there. And their main task is to let the company not just survive, but actually flourish. And that's what I want you to do as well. I don't want you to just survive in your life abroad and have a good enough life. I want you to thrive. I want you to flourish. And you can do that by getting back in that driver's seat of your life, by becoming the CEO of your expat life. But when I say CEO, I really mean the more modern CEOs. Often when we think of CEOs, we probably see an old white dude uh, who's just focused on keeping the um, stockholders happy and who's really focused on more, more, more. That's not the CEO that I mean in this way. I'm thinking of the modern CEOs who are looking to flourish in a true sustainable way that can be lasting using the resources they have in the right way with no harsh or difficult company cultures, but perhaps a more feminine approach. A good CEO in this modern world also has a lot of empathy, empathy for him or herself, for their employees, for their customers, and they are also meeting their needs the needs of the company, the the needs of the people who work there, the needs of themselves. And that is the whole package that I want you to adopt as well. I want you to become that proactive, strategic, long-term thinking CEO who is also really meeting their needs and who also has a lot of empathy for where they are right now and all the challenges that they are facing. Because if you're just the CEO with the eyes on the ball and wanting to flourish, I mean, this will get you very far. There's a lot of willpower involved, which will help you achieve all your goals and create the life of your dreams. But challenges are going to come your way. That is a given in any life and also in expat life. And I personally believe that we, especially as high achievers, are already so hard on ourselves We don't give ourselves enough credits for all the things that we're going through or that we're dealing with. We often take a more rational approach to put our emotions aside, to toughen up, to make it work. And I really want you to be softer to yourself. This is a journey I went through myself. I was really always that more, you know, toughen it up kind of person. I'll make it work. Do not feel too much pain. Just um, mind over matter, you know. Uh, But now that I've learned to be softer, to have more empathy for myself, life feels a lot lighter. So I really wish the same to you. Okay, so how do you become that CEO of your expat life? Well, I identified three pillars that I personally love to work on to really become that CEO in my life abroad. The three pillars are mindset, designing your life and meeting your needs. So let's start with the first one, mindset. In fact, I'm not going to share too much about this one because I created a whole episode around it, which is number 12. In that episode, I explain the importance of mindset and also my four-step process that I always use to change my mindset. But let me very briefly touch upon this pillar. So having the right supportive mindset really is key for expats, for anyone really. It doesn't really matter who you are or where you are. 
let me give you a quick example of how a good mindset and a bad mindset looks. So let's say you are an expat living in the Netherlands and you had the classical mistake of falling off your bike because you got stuck in one of the tram rails. This also happened to me personally, actually, even though I'm not a bike rookie anymore. But let's say there is a person, John, who falls off his bike um, and who was in a bad place mentally already. So when he's in the hospital with his broken arm, he thinks, why is nothing ever working out my way? I knew it was a mistake coming here. I hate this country, etc., etc. Now, I don't need to tell you that these kind of thoughts are not going to really help him in his recovery, right? I mean, physically, yes, probably he will recover just as anyone else would with a different mindset. But mentally, it, this is going to have a bigger effect. So probably after his accident, he will start to think more and more that he wants to leave the Netherlands because he just sees proof everywhere that this country is not for him. Now compare it to someone else, let's say Mariana. I'm actually using these two examples in a freebie that I created, which I will talk later about. But let's say Mariana has the same accident, but for the last few years, she has really worked on her mindset. So she falls off her bike, also has a broken arm and is also in the hospital. But then she thinks, ah, this is a bummer that this happened because I had so many plans and now I can't do anything with them. But, you know, I will recover. I'm grateful for the health system in this country. Although I'm not sure many expats would say that about the Netherlands, but let's say that she does. And she will think thoughts like, this is just a matter of a few weeks till I'm better and on my feet. Maybe I can actually now use all this spare time that I have. Uh, to read some more books, etc. So her mindset is already so much more supportive and this will just simply help her recovery. Again, probably not physical, although I really do believe in this link between the mental and the physical part of our lives. But at least mentally, this accident won't change her mind about the Netherlands. Now, this is a bit of a simple example, but you see how you have two situations which are really the same. All the external factors are all the same. But the internal part, the mindset really determines the outcome of the situation. And just like a CEO would, you're going to face challenges. You're going to face external developments over which you do not always have control. CEOs of companies had a tough time in the last few years with the Corona crisis. And then at least in Europe, the impact of the war in the Ukraine. And you cannot influence those things, but a good CEO knows how to go with the flow with them and not let all the outer noise, which is not always noise, but all the outer developments determine what is going on on the inside, inside the company, or in your case, inside your own mind. We have very little control over life. This is something that I found out in the last few years with both my parents dying, my grandma dying, other things that happened. I had very little influence over it. But one thing that you always, always have control over is your own mind. You can always determine your approach to things. You can always determine your own attitude towards those developments, no matter what is going on in your life. So try to nurture a mindset which is supportive and positive towards everything that you want to achieve or everything that's going on in your life. You don't want to have an inner Debbie Downer that is just criticizing you on every move that you make. Although so many of us have, we all have this inner critical voice. It is much nicer to live life from a place where you are supporting your own dreams and you have empathy for whatever's going on. And if you make a mistake that you're not criticizing yourself, but actually applauding for yourself for having tried it. If you want to know more about how to change your mindset, I really suggest you listen to that episode that I just talked about with the four step process. But very briefly, if you want to change your mindset, you need to become aware of your mindset as it is now. And that means becoming super conscious of what you're thinking, of what you're saying to yourself, but also what you're saying to others. And I mean super conscious because often we're not aware of what we're saying. And as a coach, obviously I'm trained to listen to what you're saying. So with my coaches, I often hear things that they don't themselves hear anymore. Maybe you use the words I need, or I have to, or I must, or I should all the time. 
But actually what you're then doing to yourself is you're putting a lot of pressure on your shoulders to achieve things. You're being pretty hard on yourself. So listen to the words that you're saying and change them for something better. I need to or I must can become I want to or I'm excited about. This already feels much lighter if you're working towards something. Okay, and then number two, which is about designing your life. This is absolutely my favorite part because I love redesigning my life every single time. So every year around New Year's Eve, uh, this is a tradition I started in Brazil. I take a few days to really zoom out of my life, to reflect on the past year and decide what I'm going to do going forward. I wouldn't have been able to live abroad, to quit my diplomacy career, to start my own successful coaching business if I hadn't taken those days to really reflect and make plans on what I was going to do. And one thing that has really helped me, which I think is like a super skill that I have, and that is daydreaming. I really allow myself to daydream about my life. Very often I meet people and I ask them, what do you want? And they're like, I don't know what I want. I can't imagine anything. I cannot really visualize what I want to have. And to me, it just feels so foreign because my visualization is there every single time. I daydream all the time. Also about negative things, by the way, which is not good. But mostly I use it for the more positive things that I want in life. And the more you can visualize it, the more you're telling your brain, hey, this is possible because your brain cannot really distinguish between what's real and what's made up in your mind. So the first step, if you want to redesign your life is to really allow yourself to dream about how that life would look, because you need to begin with the end in mind. If you don't know where you're going, it's really hard to come up with an effective plan. Something that I do almost on a daily basis when I wake up is that I lay in bed for another five minutes and I just visualize my future self. And very often it's related to my business. So I see myself sitting somewhere in an, working in an office or speaking on stage or doing something else. And sometimes it's more related to my personal life. So I see myself waking up in this beautiful house uh, with a beautiful husband and a lot of love in that house and friends coming over. So train your brain in visualizing how that future you, how that future life would look. This is key. And then when you have a clear image of where you want to go to, a lot of people, and this is how I did it in the past as well, is that they come up with a plan to achieve it. But often they get stuck in thinking, oh, but to achieve that or to be that, I first need to have X, Y, Z before I can start doing those things and I can become that person or be that, that something. But a critical step that I have been implementing for the last couple of years is to really become that person in the here and now already. So I ask myself also on a daily basis, what would that future version of myself do today? How would she dress? How would she speak? What would she think? What would she feel? And I would start doing those things, embodying that version of myself in the here and now already. And this has a few advantages. And one is that you're going to reach your goal much quicker because you already start doing the things instead of waiting for a condition to happen first before you can start doing those things. And the second thing is that, you know, in the more uh, traditional way of goal setting and you come up with a plan, you have to rely a lot on willpower. And in this version, well, I don't know how it is for you, but for me, I always get super excited when I start embodying that future version of myself in the here and now already. So whenever I am doubting if I should go for a run or not, you know, before I would say, okay, I, I want to train for a marathon, so I have to go. But now I'm like, no, I am that fit girl already. And a fit girl goes out for a run without questioning it. So there's a lot more excitement as like the fuel to achieve your goals rather than just relying on willpower. In my freebie that I created, which is the guidebook to becoming the CEO of your expat life, I share more about this process and I also have a few questions for you that you can think about, as well as an exercise that you can do if you find the daydreaming aspect a little bit difficult. So check the show notes if you want to know what I'm talking about so you can start applying it to your life as well. And then the third aspect is meeting your needs. 
And I'm not just talking about the basic needs like good healthy food, good quality sleep, um, time for yourself, time with friends, you know, those kind of things. Although these are important too. And I know as high achieving expats in periods of stress, these needs can often be pushed aside. I've been there myself as well. Still go there sometimes, I have to say. Um, but I'm, what I'm really talking about are more your hidden needs. Now, again, I see several levels of how hidden they are. But for example, it's really good to know if you are an introvert or an extrovert or an ambivert like myself. So I fall in between because then you know where you get your energy from. Do you recharge your battery by being alone? Then you're an introvert. Or do you recharge it while you're being with other people? Then you're an extrovert. If Secretly, actually, you find that you are an introvert, but you're spending a lot of time with people because, I don't know, that's the norm in the country that you live in, or you just really miss your close friends, then you're not really meeting your energy needs here. So that's one of the more superficial level of hidden needs that I'm talking about, but it goes a lot deeper. And I see that in my one-to-one -one coaching all the time. So let's say, for example, you are someone that has a great career and that you've always sought after prestige. Like this was the thing that always made you decide whether to go or not for a career opportunity or to try really hard to become the best at something. Now, I can't really generalize, but let's say in one-to-one -one coaching, we find out that actually you have a strong need for external validation because you never got it from, let's say, your father when you were younger. So you try to find it in those external things all the time. Now, I'm not talking about meeting that exact need because then you're just giving into the pattern that you already created. But then I think the hidden need that you have is that you should find that inner approval within yourself. So that is a need that you have, a hidden need, I would say. Or maybe you are a people pleaser and you find it really difficult to meet your own needs or to stay close to yourself or to stay centered when you're with other people. It just happens automatically that you push your own needs aside to please the other. In that case, I would say it's important that you learn to feel your own boundaries. And that could also mean that in friendships and in relationships or maybe with your family, you need to build in some extra time for yourself to be able to zoom out and to check in with yourself. Okay, what am I really feeling around all of this? And what do I want to do? So you build in some extra time to respond to the request by the other person so that you're not just automatically please them, but that you're really staying closer to your own needs and your own boundaries. Another example from myself, uh, I definitely struggle with a fear of abandonment, especially in the past. And I know that now. So I know that in relationships, I need to have open communication, which preferably also confirms a few things. So I need more confirmation from the other person than the average, although I'm not really sure if there's, there's an average. And I know that from myself already. And I've taken all the steps to deal with that fear of abandonment inside of me. So I'm not just like trying to get it from the relationship when it comes up. But I still know, okay, I just have that need. I know that this fear is present in my life. It will come up in the future again, probably not as intense as it did before, but it will come up. So I know that open and honest communication is really important for me because I can tell when another person is lying and this is when the fear gets activated. So the honesty in a relationship and being really open about your emotions and what you're feeling is key for me in a relationship. So that is one of the hidden needs that I have in a way. So when I'm talking about meeting your needs, I'm really talking about those things which are much more subtle, which happen at a much deeper level, which, you know, are not always present or always so important, but they do impact your life in a way and your well-being. And from my own experience and also the experience of my coaches, acknowledging that you have those needs, acknowledging that those patterns are going on is already bringing so much relief to them. They don't need to fight it. They don't need to push it away. They don't need to pretend it's not there. They don't need to act on it all the time. They just know, okay, I have that need. And 
when I think about that, I can already feel like softening in my shoulders as well. I feel my body more relaxing. So rather than being so tense about it, you can just relax in knowing, okay, I have that need. I struggle with this pattern. This is what's going on. And I just accept it. And this is like the more modern CEO type that I'm talking about, that the CEO also takes in the needs of their company and their own needs as well and looks at them with a lot of empathy. It doesn't mean that you always have to give in to something all the time. No, but you just have to acknowledge them with kindness that they are there and try to meet them in a healthy way so that you can really flourish. Because what I've seen in my coaching practice, the more you push your emotions aside, the more you push like the undertow that is there anyway, if you push it away, the more resistance you create inside of yourself. And that costs a lot of energy. This can really slow you down in thriving. It means you're surviving, but you're not necessarily thriving. So if you want to flourish, start acknowledging your hidden needs and start meeting them in a healthy way. And by the way, if you would like some assistance in that, you can of course always come to me for one-to-one coaching because this is really what I do in the coaching. We look really at what is going on deep inside of you and where it's coming from so we can understand it better. We can acknowledge it or you can actually. And then we slowly start to dissect it and see, okay, what can we do about these patterns here so it doesn't affect you so much anymore. And I'm going to move to Rio in January. So September is the last month that I'm taking on one-to-one clients in The Hague and Amsterdam. My online services will continue. So that's no problem. You can get on board anytime. But if you want to have in-person sessions with me, September is the last month to start. Okay, so just to recap, I want you to become the CEO of your expat life. That proactive approach, strategic, long-term thinking, doesn't shy away from making difficult choices to really go after the life that allows you to thrive, to flourish. And in my opinion, you can do that by changing your mindset into something supportive and positive, by designing the life that you want and by meeting your needs. Now, if you want to know more about these three pillars, I created the freebie. I mentioned it already a couple of times. It is the guidebook to becoming the CEO of your expat life. It is completely free and it has, I don't know, I think around 30 pages or something all around these three pillars and a bunch of extra things that I added to it to really create that CEO vibe in your life. You can download it for free. I will put the link in the show notes so you can find it. And I would also love to hear what you think of it. So if these steps and these pillars have helped you in a way, let me know because I'm really curious if my tips that have worked for me are also really working for you. Ever since I started to apply that CEO approach to my life, I really have been thriving despite everything, all the negative setbacks that I've experienced in the last few years. I really felt like I was in control of my life back in the driver's seat and really going towards my dream life. So yeah, I totally believe in the CEO approach and I would just love to hear how you're getting on with it. And to round up this episode, if you are interested in becoming that CEO of your expat life and you want to have more than just a freebie with those three pillars, but you really want to do something about it, then join Expat Life School. Because that CEO vibe is really the foundation of Expat Life School. I help you to really change your mindset and to redesign your life so that you can go towards the life of your dreams. Plus, I teach you a lot more about relationships, about dealing with an uncertain future, about feeling at home, about friendships and about so much more. But always with one starting point, you. I really believe that in order to create your best expat life, you need to start within. You need to work from the inside out. That is the only way that it's going to last wherever you go in the future. So it's really about focusing on yourself and not on the host country. Again, about being proactive and not reactive. So that is what I teach you in Expat Life School. And as I said, it's a self-paced online course. You have access to it for a year, but it also comes with five 
really nice group sessions where we dive deeper into the course topics and I will teach you lots of extra coaching exercises that I use in my one-to-one coaching all the time. And you also have the four-month community period. So you can really share with people who are going through something similar without having to explain yourself all the time. I remember when I lived abroad that it was really difficult to find real understanding with my inner circle back home because they had never lived abroad. And so in that community, you don't need to explain what you're going through because everyone is going through the same thing. So that's a nice relief already. And plus there's a lot more. You will also get masterclasses by other experts. I'm adding some extra bonuses for people who are on the standby list that you do not want to miss. One is actually about creating your best year in 2024. This is a bonus I'm super excited about. And you will know more about it if you are on the standby list. This standby list comes with zero obligations, zero strings attached. You will just receive the offer and it's up to you to decide if you want to join or not. So get yourself on the wait list to make sure you're not missing out on the offer. All right, really finishing up this episode now. As always, I would love to hear what you thought of this episode. Feel free to reach out on Instagram, on LinkedIn, via email, doesn't really matter. I always love hearing from you. And if you like this episode or the podcast in general, I would also love it if you could leave a review for me on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to, because it helps us to grow this community together. And one final note, if there is a topic that you want me to talk about, a topic you want to get tips on, or maybe some stories you want to hear from me, also let me know because I have a lot of topics in my mind already, but I would also love to hear from you guys what you want to hear on this podcast. So feel free to drop me a message. That's it for now. I wish you a lovely day ahead wherever you are. Bye-bye.